Mr. McCoy back with part 14 of what we saw. As you recall, Detective Klein was questioning Abby. Uh, if you know where Jason's hiding, you need to tell me. We'll make sure he gets a tetanus shot. Paul's really in jail? Uh, not out on bond or whatever you call it? Don't worry about Paul. We have enough on him to keep him a long time. Jason's in the shed in our backyard fall back against the sofa and try to breathe normally. I feel like I've been holding my breath since Detective Klein arrived. He turns to Officer Delaney. Go get him, but be easy on him. He's just a kid after all. I watch her leave. Jason will hate me for sure, but at least he won't get blood poisoning. Someday he just might realize I saved his life, but I'm not counting on it. Detective Klein gives me another one of his long, mind-searching looks. You're a smart girl, and so is Skylar, but neither one of you has any sense. Do me a favor and work on acquiring some. He starts to leave and stops in the doorway. Uh, we picked up your bike. It's at Skylar's house. Oh, and here's your phone. I press it to my chest like it's a sacred object. My phone. My phone. My dear phone. I'll never let it out of my sight again. By the way, he says, we weren't able to recover your image library. Luckily, we didn't need the pictures. I look at my phone. Maybe by losing all my pictures, I'm getting off lightly. Detective Klein goes to the kitchen to have a few more words with Mom and Greg. I hope he won't tell her about Paul and the trailer. I could be wrong, but he seems like the kind of person who keeps his word. While they're talking, I look out the front window and see Jason limping toward the police car with Officer Delaney. She has one hand on his shoulder. He doesn't look at my house or at Skyler's. Uh, with his head down, he climbs into the back seat of the police car. Detective Klein says goodbye to me, goes outside, and gets into the car beside Officer Delaney. Jason doesn't even glance out the window as they leave. I take a deep breath. Mom did not see Jason get into the police car. If she had, she'd ask me who he was and what he was doing in our shed, and I would have to spend some crazy explanation that she wouldn't have believed. And before I could stop myself, I'd be telling her about the nightmare in the woods. She'd probably send me to a convent in Switzerland. It's almost nine o'clock, not quite dark. Uh, the night cicadas are singing in the trees, and I'm so tired I can hardly stand up. I ask Mom and Greg if I can go to bed. I haven't heard the end of this, not by a long shot, but at least they let me leave the kitchen without another lecture. In the bathroom, I slather my legs with calamine lotion. The itch almost goes away, but I know it will be back. If I hadn't been running for my life, I would have noticed the poison ivy, but when you're terrified of one huge thing, you don't think about the little ordinary things. I get into bed and check the messages on my phone. No new ones, not even from Skylar. I think maybe I should text her and ask how things went at her house, but then I remember that she dropped her phone in the water. I'm so tired. Too much has happened today. I can't make sense of any of it. I want to sleep for a hundred years and wake up with no memory. I'll see Skylar tomorrow. We'll talk then. So what do you imagine the conversation between Abby and Skylar to be like? Share with your fellow listener. The next morning, Mom and I watch the news while we eat breakfast. So far, she hasn't had much to say. The silent treatment is her way of telling me she's mad and disappointed. I've gone way beyond the limits this time. A solemn-faced anchorman appears on the screen. Police have charged Paul Blake, a local drug dealer, with the murder of Christina Sullivan, a popular teacher at Everett Stone Middle School. He was taken into custody last night and charged with murder in the first degree, assault, operating a meth lab, drug trafficking, car theft, and a host of lesser offenses. A picture of Miss Sullivan appears briefly on the screen, followed by a clip of Paul being pulled out of a police car, his head down, his hands cuffed behind his back. Isn't that the man Greg knows? Mom asks. Uh, the one we saw at the DQ? No, it looks like him. I'm trying not to scratch my poison ivy. If Mom sees it, she'll ask me where I got it. More details tonight, the newsman promises. Mom clicks the remote screen goes blank.
I scratch while mom's not looking, but she notices anyway. Eyes in the back of her head, as they say. Is that poison ivy? I guess so. I stare at the ugly, oozing rash as if I'd never seen it before. I don't know how I got it. I'm so careful. Somewhere around that treehouse, most likely. She takes our dishes to the sink and manages to make a lot of disapproving noises by turning the water on full blast and spraying plates, cups, and glasses like she's pressure, pressure washing them. I know what she's thinking. Serves you right. If you'd stayed where you belong, you would not have poison ivy. I start to leave, but before I'm half out of my chair, she says, Sit down. I have something to say to you. Uh-oh, here it comes. I sit down and brace myself. She stands at the sink with a plate in her hand. Greg and I were talking after you went to bed last night. We decided it might be a good idea if you didn't see Skylar for a while. I don't expect this. Skylar's my best friend. She lives right across the street. You can't keep us apart. Will you please stop scratching? Mom yells like she's suddenly gone nuts. You're making the poison ivy worse. Do you want it to spread all over you? Go soak in salt water, then smear calamine lotion on your legs. She tosses a box of salt to me and starts throwing plates into the dishwasher. I run upstairs, cry, turn on the hot water and dump the whole box of salt into the tub. Then I get in. The water's almost scalding, but my legs stop itching. I lie in the tub and look at the ceiling. What will I do without Skylar? We've been friends since I moved here in third grade. We're the super-duper dynamic duo, inseparable. We're two halves of an apple. Essere la malala. The Italian words are so beautiful I memorize them, but I can't say them the way Greg did. I stay in the tub so long, the water turns cold. The tips of my fingers get wrinkles and I begin to itch again. Finally, I heave myself out and get dressed. I slather my legs with so much calamine lotion it cracks like pink mud as it dries. The smell is like summer. I'm not ready to face mom, so I lie on my bed and finish reading Fahrenheit 451. I watched the movie with Greg before I read the book, and I remember the ending where the people walk around reciting books and soft voices. Ray Bradbury's ending is very different. The hero of the story meets up with a group of men who memorize books, but there's no beautiful community, no women, no children. The United States has destroyed itself in a terrible war and the men are alone, hoping to contact other readers and start a better world. I like the movie's ending better, but probably Bradbury's ending is more realistic, except there should be a few women in the group. For my fifth and final book, I chose To Kill a Mockingbird. I have my own well-read copy. I know what happens and how it ends. It's sometimes sad, sometimes funny, and sometimes scary. But that's just the kind of story I need now, especially one that has no surprises for me. No sudden and horrible twists of fate. No dead animals. Well, except for the rabid dog Atticus shoots. Uh, the death of a rabid dog is okay. You can die from rabies. The red pony pops into my head, and I imagine how Steinbeck would write that scene. First of all, the dog would be Jim's beloved pet. When the dog gets rabies, Atticus would make Jim shoot his very own pet. I'm glad Harper Lee didn't write a story like that. Do you have a book that you like to read over and over again because it's a comfortable book and you know the ending? Share the name of that book and why you like it with your fellow listener. To keep Skylar and me apart, Mom makes sure that I spend the weekend with her and Greg. On Saturday afternoon, we go to Greenbrier Lake. Greg rents a canoe, something Mom can't afford, but it just makes me feel hot and sick and itchy. On Sunday, we go to Harper's Ferry. It takes forever to get there. We walk around the town, up and down steep hills with crowds of people and crying kids all pushing and jostling and talking so loud my ears hurt. After lunch, which I can't eat, we cross a bridge over the Potomac River and watch rock climbers scramble up a steep rock face. Then we walk at least a hundred miles on the canal towpath. It's more than a punishment than a fun weekend. My poison ivy itches and itches and itches. The hot sun makes it worse. I feel nauseated from swallowing the water in the paint branch, although it might just be psychological and have nothing to do with the water in the stream. I miss Skylar. 
On a normal day, she'd be with us. We'd be laughing, having fun, acting silly. Greg would tease us. Mom would be in a good mood. Maybe we'd stop for dinner and Skylar and I would have giggle fits about something. We'd come home after dark. Skylar's bedroom light us off. I wonder what she's been doing all day. Does she feel bad about not being invited to come with us? Did she get a new phone? I think about texting her before I go to bed, but I'm just too tired to pick up my phone. I'll talk to her tomorrow. Monday is the first day of being grounded. Skylar and I haven't talked for two days. She hasn't texted me and I haven't texted her. Now we're sitting side by side on her porch steps. Where were you all weekend? She asks me. Oh, I say in a dull voice. Greg and Mom dragged me to Greenbrier Lake on Saturday and then to Harper's Ferry on Sunday. It was hot and crowded and totally boring. How come you didn't take me? I try to come up with a reason that isn't the real reason. Oh, they wanted to do a family thing, just the three of us. Skylar looks at me. Your mom blames me for what we did. She doesn't want you hanging around with me. Am I a bad influence, right? I shake my head. She's mad at me, not you. Skylar gives me her slit-eyed stare. You never could tell a lie, Abby. Admit it. Your mom has never liked me all that much. My poison ivy starts itching, and it's all I can do not to scratch it. I don't want to have this talk. I'd rather go home and read or something, but before I can leave, Rob sits down with us. He's been mowing the grass, and he's so sweaty his skin shines. My heart speeds up, skips around. I look down to hide the blush heating my face. No matter what Skylar thinks of her brother, I still have a secret crush on him. I don't even dare to say hi because I might give myself away and Skylar will guess and never stop teasing me. Abs, he says to me, I hear you and Sky just can't stay away from Marie Drive, hanging out in a treehouse with Jason and Carter, spying on people, riding your bikes all over town. You even told the cops Mr. Boyce killed Miss Sullivan. It's juvenile detention for sure. I look at Skylar. Did you tell him? Rob answers before Skylar gets a word out. I heard the interview. After that detective left, Mom screamed at Skylar all night. Your mom must have gone nuts, too. Skylar looks like she's about to punch Rob. Shut up, pothead. Get over it, Sky. Buying that stuff was a once-in-a-lifetime mistake. Once-in-a-lifetime, she says. Don't make me laugh. Rob goes inside, and the storm door slams behind him. Suddenly, I don't want to be here anymore. Skylar is in a terrible mood. I hate the way she talks to Rob. It's hot, there's nothing to do except play spit or hearts or some other dumb card game and my legs are itching like crazy. I tell Skylar I'm going home. I need more calamine. Skylar looks at my legs, now caked with a thick pink layer of cracked lotion. You can see oozing blisters underneath. Not a pretty sight. Boy, am I glad I don't get that stuff, she says. Your legs look like something in a horror movie. A zombie, maybe, with its skin falling off. Skylar has never, ever said anything like this to me. To Rob, maybe, but not to me. My feelings are really hurt. Well, don't look at them, then. I walk away. I expect Skylar to come after me and apologize, but she doesn't. Rob catches up with me. He has my bike. The detective left this in our yard. I take it without looking at him because I'm crying again. Hey, Abs, don't cry. You know how Skye is. She's mad for a few days, and then she's over it. I don't even know why she's mad. Neither do I. Uh, you know what? Uh, I don't think she knows either. Things upset her all the time. Uh, that's all. Give her time. That's what Mom and I do. He jogs away. His legs are straight and muscled, just like Skyler's. The sun lights his hair, making it blunder. He glances over his shoulder, grins, and waves. Then he turns the corner and disappears behind Mr. Schramm's hedge. I hope Rob's all right. I know why Skylar's mad at him, but I don't know what I did to offend her. Maybe she's mad at the whole world and taking it out on me. I walk my bike into the garage. The tires are flat, the wheels are muddy, and weeds are tangled in the spokes. I'll never ride it again. Maybe I should put it on the curb for the garbage collectors. Have you ever felt like, Abby, that uh, someone just needs to be left alone and that you just need to go about your own business? Do you have a friend like that? Share with your fellow listener. And now, 
moments more of what we saw. Just as Rob predicted, Skylar gets over being mad the next day. She even apologizes for what she said about my poison ivy. Uh, zombie legs <laughs> became something to laugh about. I threatened to rub my legs against her so she'll be a zombie too. When I try to talk about what happened in the woods, Skylar says, I'm done with that. It happened. It's over. We should have spent our summer at this pool. That treehouse was a dumb kid idea. I need to understand why it happened, what we did, how she feels about it, but she's locking her memories in a secret Skylar room. Done. Over. Finished. Maybe she thinks the whole thing will shrink into the past, like, you know, something that happened long ago when we were too young to know better. I'd like to be done with it too, only what happened to us is always with me like an itch under my skin that I can't scratch. I live it over and over in nightmares, even when I'm awake. I see flashes of Miss Sullivan running into the woods and Mr. Boyce sitting in the SUV doing nothing to stop her. I smell the dead deer and the polluted water of the paint branch. I'm terrified Paul will get out of jail and kill Skylar and me. If only we could go back to the way we were before. Two halves of the same apple, sharing everything, no secrets. Skylar's new phone beeps. She picks it up and starts texting. Who's that? I lean toward her to see, uh, but she moves away, shielding the phone. We'll find out who's calling Skylar and so much more as what we saw concludes.